The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it's been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. For there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. One of Crete's own prophets has said it, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This saying is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the merely human commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and conscience are corrupted. They claim to know God, but their actions, they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Adrian. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that in these scriptures in front of us, we have truths unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity. Heavenly Father, we ask, as we've just sung, that you would speak, O Lord, fulfill in us all your purposes for your great glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the uh, great joys for me, having uh, recently moved to the area, has been to uh, meet a whole load of you and hear something of your stories and how you've come uh, to be here uh, in the Burford area, how you've come to this church, uh, how you've come to know the Lord, and how your lives have been transformed. Uh, speaking with someone a few weeks ago, I asked whether things had changed uh, when they became a Christian, and they said to me with a smile, everything changed. Last week, we heard from Titus how grace leads to godliness. The truth of God's great kindness to us, even though we don't deserve it, changes how we live. It draws out this godly living in us. And it's been striking to me to hear story after story and hear of how that's actually been happening in people's lives here in this building. We aren't a perfect people, absolutely not. But we are a transformed and changed people. I don't know about you, but I long for that to continue. I long that in my own life, I would be continuing to hear the truth of God's great kindness to me, even though I don't deserve it, and that my life would be changed. I long that for us as a church, that we would be a tr continue to be a transformed people. We long for that to happen in our communities, in the Cotswolds, in our nation, around the world. We long for grace that leads to godliness. And the question is, how? How is that going to happen? How am I as an individual going to be transformed by the gospel? 
How can our church continue to be transformed by the gospel? How can our nation, the world, be transformed by the gospel? Well, our passage today gives part of the answer. And it's this. Appoint the right leaders. We are to appoint the right vicars and bishops, appoint the right elders, ministers and pastors, whatever you're used to calling them, we need to appoint the right ones. Now that might initially sound like slight, an underwhelming answer to the question, how can we be transformed? But I'm convinced from this passage that this is vital. I'm also convinced as I look around the world, I don't know about you, but we see that leadership really matters. Whether it's a sports team and a new coach comes in and transforms the culture, or just a, or a business where a new CEO comes in and, and transforms the place. We see that leadership really matters. And I'm going to be upfront about my goal in this sermon. And it's this, and it's that we would be people who long for leaders like the one that Paul describes here. Because we want to know God's grace that leads to godliness, we would long for the right leaders, as Paul describes. So let's um, pile into our passage. And um, Paul is writing to his friend and co-worker, Titus. Uh, it seems that Titus has been left there on the island of Crete. Uh, Paul and Titus maybe started this church together. Uh, Paul's moved on to other work. Titus is left there to complete the task. This church is kind of a, a little seedling of a church. Roots are beginning to form. But greater growth is required as the roots take, take root. And there is some, uh, this church is built under Titus's, Titus's leadership. So what's Titus's first task? Well, the end of verse 5, he says, appoint elders in every town. The passage is split up very nicely for us. Verse 6 to, to 9, Paul explains what these elders are to be like. And for, verse 10 to 16, Paul explains why Crete needs these elders. First half, what, what sort of elders? Second half, why? So what are these elders supposed to be like? Verse 6 to 9. The headline is this. Blameless. Now that sounds like a very high bar, doesn't it? Leaders that are blameless. Now, uh, it's not talking about, uh, Paul's not talking about perfection here. Um, I've just come from Bible college, and I can safely say that there'll be no one in Bible colleges uh, there'd be no one who is a vicar or a pastor if the bar was perfection. But the bar is blamelessness. It's this idea of being above reproach. It's a way of saying that no one can rightly accuse this elder, this leader of godlessness. This elder rightly displays, fairly displays the characteristics that we go on to see in this passage. Now, we don't have time to go through all these characteristics in great detail, but it's striking, just glancing an eye down the list, that what Paul wants for elders and what Paul is asking for, for these elders, is character, not talent. Character and not talent. Now, as we're kind of glancing our eyes down this list of uh, qualifications for an elder. We might uh, get to get not very far and have a question. Faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe. Now we might be wondering whether Paul is saying we can only have leaders who are married with at least two children. I think Paul is assuming that this is the, the majority of the case in, in Crete at the time, that they would be married with children, but it's not a command. Um, it's more likely that he's saying that they are, if they are married, they should be faithful to their wives and sexually pure. If they have children, they should be leading the household faithfully and bringing them up in the Christian faith. Like the rest of this list, this is about character and not about talent. You see, as we look down, Paul doesn't ask these elders to be the most capable leaders or big extroverts. He doesn't ask for them to have a high capacity or great intelligence. There's no sign on this list of someone who runs a good meeting or is the most engaging preacher. T 
Titus isn't to look for elders who are the most gifted, but elders who are godly, who are not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, elders who are hospitable, ones who love what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Now, hopefully here in this room, there's a, a number of young people. There is likely coming a time when uh, you will leave home. Uh, you'll, look, uh, into a, uh, you'll go into a new kind of town or city. And at that, this stage, we ask the question, is this the sort of vicar or pastor you'll look for? All of us, at different times in our lives, will have a time to, uh, to make a choice. We'll move to a new area. Who are we going to have as our vicar, pastor, our leader? Is it going to be like the Titus 1 elders? You see, I wonder whether we can be tempted to long for leaders who are talented rather than have character. We, we are tempted to want to say, I sat under that great preacher who is, who is known all across the country for their great gifts. Or we are tempted to want the vicar who, who leads the network so then we can tell people we have that, this special vicar who, who leads, who's talented. And these are good things. Don't hear me say that we, we should kind of hate any talent or gift. We praise God for those leaders with talents and gifts. But I wonder whether our temptation is to be overruled by the talent and ignore the character. Paul's main longing is for leaders who are godly. If we long for people to know the grace that leads to godliness, then we will long for blameless leaders like this. We will be supporting and praying for godly leaders. We know, don't we, how wonderful it is to have a blameless leader. We know how attractive it is to have a consistently godly leader. We know because this is what the Lord Jesus is like. It's wonderful to submit ourselves to Jesus, who is always upright, holy, and disciplined. We must be longing for a leader who displays something of Christ's character. In them, we wonderfully get a, get a small glimpse of what Jesus Christ is like. It's not because the vicar is kind of a, a different class or a, a better Christian than anyone else. It is only of God's grace and kindness. It's only because Christ, who is so great and kind, has been at work in their lives that he, Christ has put something of his character on display through these leaders, these vicars, these elders, these pastors. Oh, how wonderful it is to be led by a Christ-like leader. Paul um, slightly uh, changes uh, kind of the kind of the description and the main goal as he, uh, or kind of adds in verse nine. Verse nine, he says, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught. Uh, the place that me and my family uh, lived before Burford, um, we were in a community, and there was this uh, this one girl who was maybe about four or five who had this soft toy bunny. And everywhere she went, she was holding on to this bunny. This bunny was so precious to her that she clung on at all times. And I don't think I ever saw her without it. And I think in kind of a similar way, Paul is asking that elders and leaders are to be like that with Paul's message. They have heard the message that is so precious, so valuable, that they cling on. They hold on. They don't let anyone ruin this message. Pastors, elders, vicars and bishops are to cling on to this and trustworthy message found in Scripture. This command highlights what makes it so tragic when we see bishops and vicars longing to move past the Scriptures, 
It's what makes it so tragic when we hear of pastors caring more about what culture thinks and what culture says is right and wrong than what the Bible says. The elder is to hold to the trustworthy message as it has been taught. What would this elder look like as they teach? By the end of verse 9, there's two voices. The first voice, the the elder who um, holds on to this trustworthy message, will be encouraging in sound doctrine. And they will also have this second voice. They will be refuting those who oppose it. Now, this is quite countercultural. That, that second voice in particular is countercultural, right? The thought of an authority figure rebuking and refuting might make us cringe. It is rarely a positive picture in our culture today. But I think this passage shows us that we need leaders who will do this. More than that, we actually want leaders to be doing this. You see, the loving, gentle, kind leader will be refuting and rebuking for our good. Let me explain more. So we can look down at verse 10 to 16. Here we see why these elders are appointed in Crete and why they must rebuke. Why Titus must appoint elders like this. And the simple answer that is there in Crete, there is great harm being done. You see, there's this poisonous mix of false teaching and ungodly culture. We aren't told explicitly what it, what it is, what the false teaching is, but it seems that there's this group of kind of Jewish Christian false teachers. Verse 10, they're described as the circumcision group. Verse 14, they seem to be teaching Jewish myths. Verse 16, they claim to know God. And we see that their teaching is causing great harm. Verse 11, their teaching is disrupting whole households. They're actually doing it for their own gain, financial gain. Verse 16, Paul describes them as detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Paul cannot stand what they are doing. They are harming people. They must be silenced, verse 11. A vicar I know um, had two builders come to his church, um, and wonderfully, uh, they heard of this grace that leads to godliness. Their lives were transformed. They became a fully uh, loved part of, uh, members of the church family. But through um, YouTube talks and meeting with um, some people in their town, they got caught up in a a cult. Uh, This cult taught many similar things to uh, Christian teaching, but they changed key aspects of the trustworthy message. The cult was doing great harm to these two guys and their eternal destinies. This loving vicar could not ignore this. Because this vicar loved these guys and he knew where the trustworthy message was found, he had to have these painful meetings with these two men, with these leaders of this this cult, seeking to correct, seeking to rebuke out of love. Now, I don't know how that story ends. I, I wish I did, but I'll find out sometime. But I think the important thing to see is you can see something of how out of love a vicar can know that they have to bring out this refuting and rebuking voice. The loving vicar and loving elder who clings on to the message will rebuke those who oppose it. We see um, another aspect to this poisonous mixture in Crete. Verse 12, one of Crete's own prophets has said it, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This saying is true. 
Now, some uh, read those verses and uh, ask whether Paul is being racist here. Um, I can kind of see why they might ask it. But however, when historians look and find sayings about Cretans of this time, again and again, we find people saying similar things. It seems that the Cretan culture is particularly harsh and ungodly. And Paul isn't saying this in kind of an unnecessary, judgmental kind of way. No, in fact, he knows that he was like them. In chapter 3, verse 3, Across the page, Paul says, At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. You see, Paul knows that he and Titus were in the same boat as as these Cretans. They have all lived ungodly and godless lives. And it is because of that that they need this trustworthy message. Paul knows it. Titus knows it. They need this message of grace that leads to godliness. The whole of Cretan culture needs the gospel of grace. And how is that going to be done? Well, the end of verse 13, in part, therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound In the faith. The loving leader of God's people will rebuke those who are living ungodly lives because they need this trustworthy message so that they can be sound in faith. They can find this wonderful grace before God. They can be safe before Him. This leader will rebuke in a loving and gentle way. They still have those characteristics of verse 6 to 8. They are still self-controlled, upright, holy and disciplined. This leader loves his people too much and knows what they need. They will be willing to have these hard conversations. As one pastor put it, a loving leader will put your eternal destiny before your present comfort and will challenge and rebuke you if they see you treading that path. A loving leader will know that what is nicest for you to hear is not always what is best for you to hear. Friends, if we know our great longing for grace that leads to godliness, we will long for leaders like this. We will want leaders that reflect Christ, leaders who hold firmly to the trustworthy message. As we close... Uh, Briefly, what what might it look like for us if we were people who longed for that sort of leader? Well, a few thoughts from me. Firstly, I think it would affect how we pray. Let's pray that the Lord would be raising up leaders like this in our nation. Let's pray for Tom, our vicar, uh, for the other ordained ministers, for uh, all those that lead in various groups, that we would be this sort of blameless leader above reproach. Secondly, if we long for this sort of leader, we will be thinking how we can encourage and support these sorts of leaders. I can think of one person uh, who I've chatted to in our congregation who has seen one of their great goals in life, one of their great ministries, is to get alongside vicars and support them and encourage them. uh, They aren't ordained, but through the course of their life, they encourage faithful gospel ministers in faithful gospel ministry. Thirdly, if we long for leaders like this, then we will be thoughtful about who we place as our spiritual leaders. I've already mentioned the young people, when you move to a new place, who will it be that you will give authority over to? There may be many opportunities for us to be thoughtful about who it is going to be, my vicar and pastor. Will they be like this Titus 1 elder? And lastly, if we long for leaders like this, we'll be thinking, How can I be a leader like this? You see, many of us have different leadership responsibilities, whether that's in the home, uh, whether that's uh, leading uh, uh, small groups here on PCC or leading the youth, the kids, whatever it is, how can I be a leader like this? Blameless, holding firmly to the trustworthy message. 
For some of us, it might mean thinking, are there other areas of leadership? For some of us, it might be ordained ministry or unordained leadership ministry where we are thinking, what would it, could I be a leader like this? What would it mean for me to long so much for this grace that leads to godliness that I could be a leader in our church? Whoever you are, if you long for God's grace that leads to godliness, then let's long for leaders like this one. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that we have the greatest, the godlier, the, the one, the, the leader with the godliness and kindness for us in Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that in Jesus we, we see the one who is blameless at all times. We thank you for how wonderful it is to submit ourselves before him. And Lord, we ask and we long for leaders here in our church and across our nation and across the world who will be uh, little reflections of that Christ-like, blameless character. Oh Lord, we pray and we cry to you that you would be building up leaders throughout who would hold firmly to the trustworthy message, longing that many might know this grace that leads to godliness. We cry for this in Jesus' name. Amen.